walking doesn't equal happiness. You know, there's a there's a lot that goes into a happy life. I see trees of green, red roses too. I see them bloom for me and for you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Hi, I'm Nina and I live in Essex and that is near London in the UK. And I'm a disability advocate and a writer. Um, and I'm really excited to be here and to meet you. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Hazel and I'm retired. And uh, uh, it's nice to meet you, and 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 nice to be here to to, to do what we're doing. <laughs> so I was born with spina bifida. So when so basically when a baby is being formed, um, really early on, sort of you know I think it's around the eight to ten week mark when the spine is being formed in babies with spina bifida. Um, the spine just doesn't form properly and this now for some people they can have a type of spina bifida where they might never know they've got it literally just doesn't affect them at all some people are born and can never walk um, some people like me might be born with full mobility and it gradually decreases um, there's so, basically it's sort of you know obviously your spine and all the nerves in it control everything below the waist um, so it kind of depends. So for me, it's everything below the waist. But if you had spina bifida and the lump was, say, higher up in your neck, then it would affect everything below that, if that makes sense. Um, it's one of those ones that, I mean, over there, I, like when I speak to friends, you know, where you guys are and they talk about how, you know, your specialists and stuff just seem amazing. Whereas in the UK, we have like, uh, you know, like there's one adult spina bifida specialist, I think, or a couple in the whole of the UK. So it's not as, and because obviously, you know, we've sort of, you know, when I was, so I was born in 1980 and, and scans weren't a thing then. So my mum and dad didn't know that I had spina bifida. Um, whereas because, you know, we have scans now and parents are given, you know, being told this news, I think something like 85% of people, you know, choose to terminate the pregnancy at that point. Um, so it's kind of, it's tricky because there's not as many people being born with it. So then there's not so much of a need to have specialists in it, if that makes sense. They are now doing like um, surgery in the womb um, and the surgery isn't to take the spina bifida away, but the surgery is there to kind of prevent serious complications. Um, and there's also uh, something called folic acid or folic acid that they recommend that um, pre all pregnant women take because it can prevent some types of spina bifida, but it doesn't prevent all types of spina bifida. I think it's just one of those things that's just kind of part of the tapestry of life, really, that it's just, yeah, I think it's always going to be around. And I realise that there's probably no cure because uh, my pain doctor told me uh, that, that, you know, that I, I had fell uh, uh, like three different times and fractured. And he says, when you fracture, your spine turns, you know, folds. Mm -hmm. And when that heals, that uh, fracture, that doesn't come back up, that cuts your height. And mm -hmm. I've had my height cut about three inches because he said it each time that spine folds down, it's like you rolling a piece of paper and getting smaller and smaller, you know, down, you know. And so, but I, I do think it's probably something that that I have accepted that I'm gonna I have to live with, mm. you know. And uh, I just, uh, if I'm doing something that's rather painful, uh, then I stop that. You know, I mean, I have to quit. Uh, you, you just kind of have to change your life around and, you know, and, and go with the flow, so to speak. You know, whatever, you know, that, you know, when I sit down, 
I have no pain. Mm. But when I stand up, I feel, doctor did not tell me this, but I feel like maybe a raw nerve is touching the spine. It's like getting a tooth filled and, and the Novocaine didn't work. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, they're hitting the raw nerve, you know, and, you know, and I can't stand too long up without sitting down. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's kind of what I was like before. Like I used to get, a, when I was still standing and walking around, I would fall over all the time because my legs just weren't very strong. But I used to get like that kind of tingly, sort of electric -y nerve pain in my legs. And, and now I use the wheelchair. I don't get that at all, which is a bonus of using the wheelchair. Um, have you found, has it kind of, as your mobility has changed, has it kind of stopped you from doing anything that you used to really enjoy doing? Well, uh, it has stopped, you know, uh, I, I don't know if that I enjoy it, but, you know, I used to be able to get up on little stools or little small ladders and take care of small things in the house. Uh, I don't do that because you know, I know the danger of falling, mm. you know, and it would be great for me. You know, if for me to fall and take a real hard fall would be disastrous, you know, mm. for probably. And I and so I, I eliminate that. I either, you know, either the grandchildren do it or I hire it. <laughs> you know, you just just your life, you know? Hmm. Yeah. And you become I I like to sort of say that I'm kind of like the manager now because I just delegate jobs to everybody else. Um you know, I'm just very good at watching everybody else do stuff while I just tell them what to do. It's, it's quite good. But I feel uh, I would never uh, uh, want to have back surgery. I hear, you know, and, you know, of course, I'm not medically inclined, but back surgery doesn't always, it's not the answer. <laughs> no, I think sometimes you're in worse shape than you were before, you know? And, yeah. Uh, what do you think about acupuncture? You know, they have these doctors that advertise, you know, no, no cutting. And, you know, somehow or the other, they go down and, you know, pushing on the back or something. It's, how do you feel towards that for this? I'm not sure. I've never, I've never tried anything like that myself. Um, so I don't, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I mean, I've heard good things about acupuncture, but I think it depends, you know, what you've got going on and how severe it is. And, you know, as you say, I think often when it's to do with the spine and the back, you know, you start fiddling and prodding around, I think you can, you know, you can make things sort of cause more harm than good sometimes, I think. I do have a walker, of course, I have osteoporosis, you know, but that the doctor told me that I do have uh, some spine uh, trouble, yes. Mm -hmm. How do you find getting around with the walker? Does it help? Excuse me, I didn't understand. Sorry, do you, um, so you use a walker when you're sort of walking. Does it, does it sort of, do you feel more well, secure when yeah, you're using I, I, I believe uh, my primary doctor told me, especially for osteoporosis, walk, walk, you know. Uh, uh, I have found since I've been here because I had steps at my home right. to go to the basement. And of course, living in Missouri, you know, you have uh, basements and stuff, you know, for, that you have to go up and down, you know, for different things. I, I don't think my back hurts quite as bad mm. because I think maybe the, too much activity that was hard for the back, mm. you know, like climbing steps or you know or trying to carry something upstairs you know mm. yeah so you don't have to do that now no no that's good mm -hmm. yeah we like when I moved into the house I'm in now um it wasn't sort of adapted at all so it was really difficult but we got like a ramp fitted this year so I'm able to just sort of actually leave the house on my own now um which is really good um yeah, so for, I mean, I think it depends where you live. Um, you know, it depends if you work. It depends on a lot of factors. But in general, I think in the UK, 
um, somebody worked it out, a disability charity worked it out that it costs on average about nearly £600 a month more just to live as a disabled person because of all the extra expenses and adaptions and equipment um, and all of that that you tend to need. Does insurance pay for anything that you have done? And, and like the situation you're speaking of? That's a very good question. And no, it doesn't. Um, I mean, we're lucky over here that, you know, we have the NHS. So um, the NHS means you get, you know, your health care for free, pretty much. Um, but when it comes to, um, you know, like if you're disabled, when it comes to a lot of the extra equipment and stuff, we don't although we have health insurance over here, if you've got a disability or, you know, like a lifelong condition, we can't use that insurance. So although, you know, if I got ill, if I broke my leg, I could go to the hospital and that would all be completely free. Like um, the wheelchair I would have got for free just wasn't suitable. It was like the sort of cheapest, bare minimum, um, couldn't push it on my own. So for a lot of us, if we want, you know the right equipment we have to fund it ourselves there's sort of charities um you know some charities you can go to a lot of people just try and raise money themselves but yeah it's not great uh what are some of the misconceptions people may have about you and other uh, disabled people i think for me it's like people don't um I think people presume because i'm in a wheelchair that i must have a sad life um and I'm probably like that. I'm probably having the best sort of time of my life than I ever have. And people presume they never think I'm a mum if I'm out with my children or my partner. I think they think my partner is my carer. I'm not sure who they think the children belong to, but they definitely don't think they belong to me. Um, so that's always a you can see sort of people's like their the look on their face. Like if Jace, my other half, like kisses me in public, people are like. They just, oh, are they together? That's weird. Um, so I think people just presume disabled people have no kind of social life, no friends, that they don't work, that they don't have fun or swear or drink or do any kind of adult things. Um, I think, as you say, people can get sort of annoyed with me if I'm in the way. Um, other people, you know, can just see me doing something really regular, like going to the shops, which isn't a problem for me. And they'll be like, oh, you're so amazing. And I'm like, I'm just going to the shops. It's, you know, so I think there's people don't really sort of see us as, you know, like full human beings. I think they just see us as something to kind of feel sorry for or, you know, think we're really inspiring. Whereas I'm literally just like a normal person, but I happen to be sitting down in a chair on wheels. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't want sympathy. You know, I tell people, I don't want sympathy. Uh, this is just something that has happened to me, and uh, uh, I don't have, I don't expect other people to go out of their way, and you know, and, and I, you know, I, I want to be independent. I was always independent, and and, and you know, and and I'm kind of a, uh, a tough old lady. <laughs> you know, I can, uh, you know, but my doctors tell me that too. You know that. That you know, I'm I'm strong as far as the, the you know, I I don't give up. I don't mm. give up easy. Yeah, I'm like that. I'm sort of I can fall over and I'll be like I can get up by myself when I get all like that. And it took me a long time to kind of accept sort of help off of other people because um, I was just yeah a bit like no I can do everything myself. But as time's gone on, I've had to kind of realize that I can't do everything myself now so I do have to sort of delegate a bit but my independence is really important to me as well so I think um in general like I think again I think it's always been kind of taught that being disabled is something like scary or you know the end of the world um you know I think people sort of it's like glasses, like when we talk about mobility aids, like glasses. Mm -hmm. I know that years ago, glasses were something that people were embarrassed about wearing, whereas now glasses are really fashionable and they're really cool. And I think it's kind of just sort of, so like when we talk about things like walking sticks, like canes, um, wheelchairs, even like, you know, your walker that you use, 
I think they're just starting to kind of um, become more fashionable. Like over here now, you can get, you know, sparkly canes. And, you know, I've actually got a walker and it's bright red and I absolutely love it. And I think that in the past, all of these things, if you were told that you had to use a walking stick or you had to use any kind of like assistive device like that, it felt like, oh, well, I'm giving in or that's embarrassing or, you know, like I've got my um, my father in law is in his 70s and he clearly needs some sort of mobility aid. But he's like, well, no, I'm you know, I'm too young for that. And I think there's this kind of notion that, you know, all of this stuff is just so grey and medical and awful. And that's not the case. And it doesn't have to be the case. I, I use, I can use a cane, hmm. if I have to walk very far, uh, cane is very, takes a lot out of you, because you know, you're having to get it. And uh, I use a walker more if I had to walk. Uh, I am um, at a point now, I don't know what it will be in the future. Uh, one pain doctor told me that what I had uh, could, get worse and perhaps I could be in a wheelchair someday but right now I kindly am impressed that yes th there's pain but but you know we have to learn to live a lot of pain mm. we have to kind of accept it mm. <laughs> excuse me uh, uh, you, you know uh, pain is something after and I cannot take pain medication because I take blood thinner. I had right. cancer in the liver. And so, you know, and I can't take uh, pain pills because of that. And because of the warfarin, the blood thinner mm -hmm. would make it go thinner, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I have to just kind of like, uh, use a cream, you know, that rubs on my back, you know, to help me. And it does help me. So I feel most fortunate that I could be worse. You know, that a lot of people are in a lot of worse pain than I am. Mm. Yeah, I know like for some of my friends um, who have got more like sort of chronic illnesses as opposed to like a physical disability. Um, and they are just, you know, and they're in sort of so much pain. But as you just kind of said, they learn to kind of live with that pain and still, you know, live a life. And I think from the outside, people sometimes look at them like, oh, you're fine. And they're really not. But it's just what they've learned to deal with and to manage. You just have to really, uh, uh, pain can get so bad that, you know, that, it, you know, you, you know, it's unbearable. But what you have to do, you have to learn to take off time and, and 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 rest when it's like that, and and you just kind of learn to live with pain. Well, yes, you know uh, how it is affected it affects your life completely, one hundred percent. At at the beginning, because uh, I was very active and the, you know could do about anything, and and then I had to learn that that I had to realize what I could do and what I couldn't or how much I could do. And you kind of learn this and you, you kind of have to change your life uh, mm. to the point of uh, uh, adjusting your life to your disease. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I've, you know, and I think it's been the same for me in terms of um, you know, I spent a long time, although I was born with spina bifida, I spent a long time being able to walk. And if you'd looked at me, just, you know, you wouldn't have known that I was disabled. Um, and then over time, as sort of my mobility has, you know, decreased, you know, I can't go out necessarily dancing anymore like I used to, but I'll spin around and dance in my kitchen in my wheelchair. You know, it's sort of, as you say, kind of adapting you know, to your own body and to what you're capable of doing. I mean, how did you find when you started using your walker? Was you like, was you happy to use it? Uh, well, to to go back when I first started uh, having, you know, I fell several times, and 
I used the cane at mm. the beginning for balance. At first, I was like embarrassed because I had this pride, this uh, uh, because I had worked till I was 82 years old, and and uh, I, you know, I I thought, oh, I can't do this, you know, you know, you know how you feel sometimes, you know, when you're, you you know, you just kind of feel that this pride falls for right. And I, but, and then I thought, that didn't bother me. I thought, I'm doing it for me, mm. uh, you know, and then I see so many people anymore with canes and walkers. And, and I, I decided this is what I need. And it's, it's my life now. And I will accept the fact that I need it. And when I pick up, you know, my walker, when I go for a walk, uh, I, I'll be very honest with you. I don't care what people think because you know what? It helps me. <laughs> I love that. It's exactly that. You know, it's so true. Like I, I started, when I started using a walking stick, um, I was in my early 30s. So every single time I went out with it, I'd get people come up to me and be like, oh, what have you done? And I'd be like, nothing I'm disabled and then they'd be like oh I'm so sorry and then I'd have to be like no you don't need to be sorry I'm, I'm great I'm having a lovely time um and I think as you say I used to be when I first started using the wheelchair I was so I don't it's not that I was embarrassed but I was so aware of people looking at me um and I just sort of avoided going out whereas now like you say I don't care because when I used to go out before I had the wheelchair and I was falling over all the time and I was, I was using like two crutches and I was so, I hardly ever went out basically because it just wasn't fun because I was too worried about falling. Um, and now I use the wheelchair. I'm just like whizzing around and zooming about and it's fun. I've got my freedom back. So the people who stare at me now, I just think, Oh, you know, it doesn't matter because you know, for me, my, I don't see my wheelchair as this sad thing that, you know, oh, I'm wheelchair bound. For me, it's like, you know, a shiny bike or a new car. It's like great bit of equipment that means that I can kind of take my kids out and, you know, just get a life back again. So I think, I think that uh, I agree with you because uh, you, you, what you need, you either stay at home and never go out or you use your wheelchair or walker or whatever. And so, you know, to have a life, then you have to accept that. And you just actually, uh, most people, like I say, are very kind. Uh, uh, but if, if you meet people that are not, you know, uh, ignore them. Uh, but because you're in a position where you have to have this, you have, you have accepted the fact I'm here. This is what's wrong with me. I have no choice. Mm. And, you know, you can either stay at home and feel sorry for yourself, or you can get out there and and do things you can. You know, yeah, exactly that. And yeah, and it's you know, and it's the best way to be. And I think, you know, the more people that do that as well, the more it doesn't become as weird. The more to say, you know, the more. Like, for instance, the thing that I hated doing the most was taking my kids to school because, you know, I, you know, to see sort of somebody in a wheelchair in a school setting in that way just wasn't the norm. Um, but then I thought, actually, I sort of flipped it on its head and thought I'm kind of, you know, showing people that, you know, disabled parents exist um, you know, and then maybe in the future when somebody else comes to that school, if they're in a wheelchair, it won't feel as weird because people are just, you know, used to it. Well, I think that, um, you, that you know, that just, just you just have to accept, you know, I, I want to say that, you know, uh, I believe in God and I believe in prayer and and I I believe you know that that God would take care of me, and and you know and you know and when the time and when I'm out, you know I I I just feel like that He's with me, mm -hmm. you know and and He and 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 He's I have had many many things good things happen to me, you know through the years it because of this you know. Mm -hmm. And and uh, 
So I just take one day at a time because mm -hmm. that's all we got, yeah. you know? And, and so I take one day at a time and, and, and when my time comes, I'm 88 years old. Uh, uh, when my time comes, it'd be my time. And until then, I'm going to live the best I can. I'm going to do everything I can. Yes, I love that attitude. Mm, as to go. So ableism is basically discrimination against disabled people. So how you kind of have racism and homophobia. So ableism is that kind of thing of thinking disabled people are less than, that they're just, you know, not as good as non-disabled people. I, I think that sometimes people, uh, a few, uh, looks at people that's, Handicap uh, in many form, um, and they look at them with a different view. But just remember, this could be you. Mm. They, you know that. It, so uh, just just be thankful. You know, I say be thankful that that you have as healthy as life as you do. I tell myself because mm. a lot of people are worse off than you. Mm. Yeah, I think I think like, you know, everybody, like you say, anybody can become disabled at any moment. If you live long enough, your body is going to start, you know, deteriorating because that's what bodies do. And, you know, for for most, I think everybody pretty much goes through some sort of disability, whether it's, you know, breaking your leg or getting along, you know, an illness for quite a while. And, you know, I think it sort of impacts everyone um you know this i think i mean i don't know what the stats are worldwide but like in the uk <clears throat> excuse me in the uk there's like 15 million disabled people um but you know we still don't have access to like the tube like london tube stations most of them i couldn't go on because they're not accessible um a lot of businesses still aren't accessible and you know disabled people can work not you know not every disabled person but a lot of disabled people if the right kind of accommodations are in place if the right access is in, in place they could work um but people just don't really you know i don't know it's hard i think people just don't really bother um because i think that i think it becomes this vicious circle of because the world's so not accessible a lot of disabled people just tend to stay at home and then people are like, oh, well, we don't need to make this shop accessible because we don't get any disabled people in here anyway. Um, you know, so ableism kind of, you know, it's just this view of disabled people that, you know, as I say, that we're less than and it, and it ends up meaning that disabled people can't live their best lives, that we can't thrive and enjoy life like everybody else because you know, everybody has access needs, don't they? Like even non-disabled people have access needs, but it's just the majority of people kind of get theirs met. Like, you know, most people would walk into a restaurant and know that there's going to be a toilet in there because that's just, you know, how it is. And you, you wouldn't even think to ask because of course there'll be a toilet there. But as a disabled person, you do have to ask, you know, because most places don't have a, you know, a disabled toilet. So it's just, it's, it's things like that. Um, you know, my, my impairment is one thing that can't be changed, but things like, you know, ramps getting into a shop and, and, you know, me being able to go to a theater show and people's attitudes, they're all the things that actually can be changed that would improve my life. I think, I mean, accessibility is obviously a huge, you know, a huge one. Um, and I also think kind of, you know, no sort of hierarchy to these things, but I think representation is really important because when we see this, you know, we hardly ever see disabled people in films or on the telly. And when we do, it's normally like, you know, they're there to be, you know, I feel sorry for them or they're, you know, it's, you very rarely just watch a film that happens to have a, you know, to somebody using a cane or in a wheelchair or on crutches, but the storyline doesn't revolve around that. You know, they just, they're a lawyer or a teacher and they happen to use a wheelchair um, because that's actually, that's what life is. You know, disabled people can live very boring, mundane lives, exactly the same sort of lives as anyone else. And I think if there was more sort of accurate representation that would, you know, 
that would sort of normalise disability more. And also when we do tend to see disabled people on the telly, even if it's on the news or in a newspaper, in whichever form it is, you will always find out what's wrong with them. You know, you'll always find out their medical condition. Um, you know, and I think it's been like that forever. Um, you know, everybody wants to know what's wrong with you. You know, why are you disabled? But nobody ever talks about the social issues. So if we heard more about inaccessibility um, and the attitudes to disabled people, because those are the things that you can change. Um, so I think, you know, all of that, I think the rep accurate representation, talking more about the social issues that disabled people face would then help to make sort of change within accessibility and infrastructure. It's kind of like the sincerity prayer. What you can't change, you have to accept. You know, sometimes people, I think all of us, whether you're disabled or not, we have good days, we have bad days. You might have, you know, somebody might have a, a terrible year, you know, a year where something's awful, but the following year things get a bit better. And I think it's very easy to look at people and think, oh, well, they've got a better life than me. But actually, you can't always tell because somebody could look like they have this great, perfect life, but actually it's, you know, not great. And I think, you know, there's a lot, you know, I always kind of say walking doesn't equal happiness. You know, there's a there's a lot that goes into a happy life. You could get somebody else with exactly the same condition as me using a wheelchair. But, you know, they might not have the support I've got, the family I've got, the friends I've got. You know, there's so much that goes into it. And I think we just have to, you know, like you said earlier, Hazel, you know, kind of just taking a day as it comes, um, you know, and, and not looking behind and not looking too far ahead because that's, not, <coughs> sorry, that's my dog. Shush. Um, <coughs> he will stop in a minute. <coughs> stop it. In, go inside. Right, he's gone. Um, oh, I, was on, I was having such a good role then. I was being a wise and stuff. Um, you know, but I think we're not guaranteed anything, are we? So I think it's, you know, for me, I try not to look around, at, you know, and compare my life to anybody else's because this is the life I've been given. Um, you know, I'm not sure how I feel about religion or anything else, but I truly, truly believe I was meant to have this life. Um, you know, uh, my one, I've got four children and one of my sons has spina bifida like me. And I believe that that was his journey that he was supposed to have. Um, you know, so I try not to, yeah, to sort of compare myself to too many other people because I think that just leads to, can lead to feeling really miserable. Um, so just kind of being grateful for what I've got. Your dog's getting impatient. <laughs> he is. I, I had to keep the door open because it's really warm. And then for some reason, whenever I'm in here, he just feels like he has to be in here too. Just giving him a little stroke. I think in general, how people can not specifically spina bifida, but I think, you know, people with disabilities in general, you know, if you have a disabled family member, if you have a disabled friend, it's just sort of asking, you know, like really simply what, you know, is there anything I can help you with? What are your access needs? Like that's my favorite question. What are your access needs? Um, because then I can say to somebody, you know, I'm going to need step free access to get into here or, you know, and I think it's the same as when I'm out and about, like sometimes people will presume that I can't do something. So they'll rush to help without asking. But sometimes I'm actually, you know, what we were saying earlier, Hazel, about wanting to be independent. Sometimes I'm actually practicing, you know, I might be practicing opening a door on my own or getting something off of a shelf and I, I, you know, when if somebody comes and asks me, you know, that's great. But often people will just sort of swoop in, like, I'm going to be a hero and help this young woman in need. And I'm like, I don't need it. I'm fine. Um, so I think like not presuming that a disabled person isn't capable and just just art, just being decent. I think like just treating disabled people no different than you would treat any other person. I think it's, uh, I, I love, I love to help people. Uh, it makes me feel good uh, if I can do something uh, it, to, to, to help other, other people and know that I've made a difference in their day or mm -hmm. in their lives, you know. Uh, I, I get a joy out of that. I love people. 
I, I love being around people, probably talk too much, <laughs> but uh, I just, I believe that uh, we just take, like you say, one day at a time and, and, you know, we, and, and, you know, and that there's an old saying, something about the, the, the yesterday's gone and, you know, you know, and, today, and, you know, and that, you know, you, you don't even have tomorrow. You just have today. So just take one day at a time and that's what you got. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really true and very wise. And it's how I try and live my life most of the time. If, how you can find out more about the lady's uh, information and her story today. Also for me, I am on Instagram and Facebook, both under Nina Tame. Um, yeah, that's where I do the majority of all my work. Thank you. Thank you. It's been so nice meeting you and chatting with you today. It's been a pleasure. You've been a joy, you know. And um, can I ask you a question? Are you are are you in Germany? Are you German? No, no, British. Irish. I know British. British, British. Uh, I I detected a little bit of you know uh, uh, the, I worked with people so much that I I it was a hobby of mine to I threw that in for extra, <laughs> <laughs> but you know but it was a hobby of mine to to uh, recognize voices. You know they spoke in English, but they had the I could tell, and I thought that you had a little bit of. A German accent. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, you're fine. It's not an insult. No, it's, it's my Essex Essex accent. That's what it is. So we can have a little little uh, fun on the end, can't we? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. It's, a pleasure. it's been a pleasure. You're a wonderful, sweet person. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So are you. I've I've really loved chatting to you, Hazel. It's been great. And I think to myself. What a